Welcome back to Private Pilot Ground School. This video is one of two on airplane systems. Some of you might be familiar with how engines work, and for some, this might be the very first time you're seeing engines from this perspective. There are two main engine types in aviation, the turbine and the reciprocating or piston engine. Most small airplanes have a piston engine that is similar in a lot of ways to a car engine. When you look at a model number, you'll see something like this. The O means that the cylinders are horizontally opposed. That means that they are arranged horizontally and they're opposite of each other. Uh, in a car, usually you'll have vertical cylinders that go up and down. In an airplane engine, they are horizontal. The 235 is the cubic inch displacement, or in other words, how much air and fuel the engine can hold. And the last part is the model number. A lot of the POHs will explain to you what the capabilities of the engine are and they will decipher some of these codes so you can look in uh, section 1 for those. Now here are some engine parts. We have a cylinder. You have four of these if you have a four cylinder engine. We have a piston, a connecting rod that connects the piston to the crankshaft, and the crankcase is where the crankshaft rotates. We have spark plugs, we have intake and exhaust valves, and keep in mind that everything will be sideways because it's horizontally opposed and the propeller would be at the end of the crankshaft. So all these four cylinders will rotate a crankshaft and that crankshaft will connect to the propeller. Airplane engines are mostly four stroke. This means that the power is generated as the piston moves up and down a total of four times, hence the four stroke. The first stroke is the intake stroke. As the piston moves down, it creates suction and pulls the fuel and air mixture inside through the open intake valve. The second stroke is the compression stroke. As the piston gets down to the bottom, the intake valve closes and keeps the fuel and air mixture inside. And as the piston moves up, it squeezes the fuel and air mixture. The power stroke begins when the spark plugs ignite the fuel and air mixture and the pressure from the explosion sends the piston down again, creating power that spins the crankshaft. And finally, the exhaust stroke is when the exhaust valve opens, the piston comes back and all the burn gases leave the cylinder. The way fuel gets to the engine can be either via a carburetor or fuel injection. Fuel injected engines deliver the fuel and air mixture right to each cylinder. In a carbureted engine, the fuel and air mix inside the carburetor. And so here's a picture of a carburetor. We have an air inlet on the bottom. This is where air enters into the carburetor. We have a discharge nozzle, and this is where fuel gets added into the air mixture. And if you notice, there's this curved part inside the carburetor that looks vaguely familiar, and that's because it's a venturi tube. So there's low pressure inside that venturi. In other words, there's a suction there, and so that sucks the fuel into the air. We have fuel inside the chamber right here. And then we have this little needle, and that's the mixture needle. And this is controlled by your mixture control, the red knob inside the cockpit. And basically you're plugging the hole on the bottom there to either let more fuel in or let less fuel in. And as we go up in altitude, there's less air density, so you will have to decrease the amount of fuel to keep the fuel and air mixture the same. This is the fuel inlet. This is where the fuel comes into the little chamber here from the wing tanks. It works on the same principle your toilet does. There's a float, and when the level gets low, the float goes down, opens up the fuel inlet, and more fuel comes into the little chamber from the wing tanks. We also have the throttle valve, and this is controlled by your throttle. So the more open the throttle is, the more air can get into the carburetor, the more fuel can get mixed with it, and you get more power to the engine. So overall, it's a fairly simple system. You have a venturi that sucks the fuel in and it vaporizes the fuel, mixes it with the air, and then that fuel-air mixture is sent to the cylinders. Now when this fuel gets vaporized inside the venturi, what happens is the temperature drops quite a bit. When the temperature is below 70 degrees Fahrenheit and the humidity is above 80%, carburetor ice is likely to form. So basically when there is moisture in the air and it starts getting a little cooler, there's a really high potential for getting carburetor ice. You can tell the airplane has carburetor ice when the engine starts running a little bit rough and there's a loss of power. Now we obviously want the engine to keep running and this is where carburetor heat comes in. Carb heat preheats the air before it gets inside the carburetor. Now the one disadvantage of carburetor heat is that hot air is less dense than cold air. So basically there's less air going through the carburetor when carburetor heat is on. 
In a fixed pitch propeller airplane, the RPM will drop when you apply carb heat and as the ice melts, the RPM will slowly start to increase. Now with a constant speed propeller, you will see a drop in manifold pressure and then a slow increase as the ice melts. We need electricity to produce a spark to ignite the fuel and air mixture and airplane engines do that by using magnetos. Magnetos are magnets that are spun whenever the engine spins and they produce the electrical current that generates a spark and they're completely independent of the electrical system. So as long as the engine is turning over, the spark is being produced. And we have two spark plugs per cylinder, one per magneto, we have two magnetos. And the reason we have two magnetos is backup and also it uh, provides better fuel combustion and it's more even. Now when you look at the ignition switch in the cockpit, it's a little different than the one in your car. There are four positions, we have off, left, right, and both, and also start. And so you can pick either one or the other magneto or both and you'll be cycling through these when you're doing your pre-takeoff check to make sure that each magneto is working like it's supposed to. Now the danger in forgetting the key in the ignition is huge. If the magnetos are left on and someone spins the prop, the engine can start if there's any fuel left in the cylinders. The magnetos don't need any electrical current as long as the engine's spinning or as long as the propeller's spinning they will produce a spark and so that can start the engine even if the electrical power is off. So be careful, make sure you take the key out after the plane is shut down. The purpose of having oil in the engine is to lubricate the system. Basically anything that's rubbing together or spinning gets oil put on it so that it reduces the wear and tear. The oil gets circulated through the engine and as it moves around it takes the heat and it transfers that heat somewhere else. It also carries away contaminants that are found in the engines, like little metal shavings. Now the one thing you have to remember is hot lop. This is high oil temperature or low oil pressure. And if you have a combination of both of those, that's a bad deal. Basically when you get hot oil temperature, that means that you don't have enough oil and that little that you do have is circulating around and getting really, really, really hot. And so that's a bad thing. Low oil pressure also means not enough oil or maybe you have an oil leak and so your pressure is very low. So if you get both of those, hot oil temp and low, t uh, low pressure, you might need to pull over, I mean land. Needless to say, oil is a very important part of the engine, so make sure you've got plenty of it when you pre-flight the airplane. Now we already know the engine is cooled by the oil system. It's also cooled by the airflow getting into the engine cowling from the front. And there are these things inside the cowling that are called baffles that direct the airflow over the hottest engine parts so that the air doesn't just go everywhere without a specific purpose. Baffles are basically rubber strips and they direct the air to where it's supposed to go, usually hottest parts of the engine. The cylinders themselves look a lot different than the cylinders you'll see in a car in that they have big fins on them and that increases the cooling area so the cylinder can get cooled a lot more effectively. And finally, we'll talk about hydraulics. They're fairly simple on small airplanes, but as you fly bigger and faster things, it gets a lot more complex. The only hydraulic things in most training airplanes are the landing gear and the brakes. We won't talk about retractable landing gear, but you can read about it if you're interested. The brakes work on a fairly simple principle. Each rudder pedal has a cylinder of hydraulic fluid behind it. When you press the top of the pedal, that fluid gets pushed to the brake pad, which squeezes and slows down the wheel. So the left rudder pedal controls the left brake, the right rudder pedal controls the right brake. And the harder you press, the quicker the airplane will stop. The pedals are usually interconnected so that pressing your left pedal has the same effect as your co-pilot pressing the left pedal. And there you have it, that's part one of two of aircraft systems. That wasn't so bad, was it? Let me know in the comments below if that made any sense. If it didn't, make sure to read the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge chapter on aircraft systems. If you do have questions, leave them in the comments below or maybe watch part two of this systems video that might answer some of them. And as always, have fun, fly safe, and always keep learning. See you next time.